So welcome everyone in today's lunch talk, um, the last one already of our spring season uh, of lunch talks. Uh, before we take a two month break for the summer uh, holidays, uh, although summer seems quite far away with this weather, of course. Um, but we'll be back in September with more talks, more topics and more speakers. Uh, so, of course, if you want to stay up to date uh, and be the first one to know about our upcoming talks, be sure to register for our newsletter and you can do so by scanning this QR code. And I will also share the link in the chat and in the follow up mail afterwards. And since we are joined by so many today, uh, I will give a short introduction uh, about myself and our project uh, before we get started. So my name is Annelies van Dijk. I am the project manager of the Psychum Academy at Saimingo, uh, which is a Flemish nonprofit organization based here in Brussels. And we want to help people take their first steps into science communication. So we do this with our various projects. We have the Flemish Thesis Award, we have the Flemish PhD Cup, and we also have the Psychum Academy. And I very shortly also want to encourage everybody to look at the other projects because we have our applications running for the PhD Cup, for example. And with our Psychum Academy, we organize on one hand monthly free online lunch talks, like the one of today, where we cover a wide range of topics related to science communication or research, uh, for which we invite um, science communicators like today or experts in their fields to talk about it. And on the other hand, we also have our in-person training courses um, to help you reach out using various platforms or using various tools. And we really want to encourage you to create something that you can use to reach out to your broader audience. Uh, for example, we have trainings in creating a three minute video pitch about your research or a popular scientific blog. Uh, you can discover all of them also on our website. And uh, as said, we just launched our fall season of workshops um, and training courses. So you can take a look at them by scanning the other QR codes uh, and it will take you directly to our websites. Uh, next season, we also have two new training courses. We have on one hand, ChatGPT for science communication and a workshop on poster design. And today our lunch talk is like the ideal um, introduction to this workshop because I'm joined today by Tom Verlinde, who will be our coach for this workshop. And today in our talk, uh, he will share with us six essential insights to create a good scientific poster uh, to have real impact. Uh, but of course, if you want more tips and tricks or if you want personal feedback on your poster, make sure to register for our workshop, which will take place on the 6th of November. And just before, I will now give the floor to Ton uh, to let him introduce himself. And also the floor is yours to you. I uh, want to encourage you still to ask all of your questions in the Q&A window or in the chat throughout the full talk so that we can really tackle them uh, along the way and that we can adjust uh, as much as possible to your questions and your needs. So with that said, uh, I think it's time to give the floor to Ton. And I will wish you, as always, a very interesting and insightful talk. All right, welcome everyone at this poster workshop. Um, we're with a lot of people, that's nice. Uh, so welcome Augustina, Kato, Charlotte. I won't go over all the names, of course. Jacob, Louise, Patricia, Ruby, you're with so many. Thanks for joining. Um, now, before we jump into the workshop, Annelies has just launched a poll um, with the question, if you have ever made a scientific poster before or not. And Annelies, are there already some people who answered that poll? Or can you can you show me some results in one way or another? No, apparently not. <laughs> Let me just restart it. Maybe maybe this is what it means. Ah, now I can see it. Okay, yes. Sorry. So was... there's a question. Have you ever made a scientific poster before with some simple answers? Yes, no, or maybe you're working on one right now. Um so yeah, good for me to know where you are, if you have ever made one before or not, before we jump into the lunch talk. I don't know if you can see the... I can't see the results, Annelies. Oh, it's so exciting. Um, Maybe you can just give me the numbers, more or less. So, um, almost everybody says yes. I think 
71% says yes, 20% says no, and 9% is currently working on their poster. All right, wonderful. So most of you have made a poster before. Um, I'm guessing it's for a whole bunch of reasons. It could be like a very, ah, now I can see the results, yeah. Um, I think it could be for a very narrow focused conference. It could be for a very broad conference with a lot of participants. Maybe it was for a master thesis. Maybe it was for a, a patient organization. Maybe it was for an industry day. Maybe it was during a research day at your institution. There are so many occasions where you can make a poster. I also see some people are working on a poster right now. So I hope this workshop uh, helps you do that. Um, if you have a post session coming up in the near future, uh, this workshop can help you, of course. Um, now, if you have ever experienced being at a poster session, being it as a visitor or being it as a, as a researcher participating with your poster, strange things start to happen sometimes. So imagine you're a researcher, you're standing next to your poster, um, you've put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money as well to be there probably, or to print the poster. And you're standing next to the poster and people pass by and nobody seems to stop at your poster and you're unsure like, how does this even work, this poster session? Do I need to talk to people? Do they talk to me? And you're wondering, can I get more out of this? Yeah. Now, on the other hand, you have the visitors of the poster session. They're under a lot of time pressure as well. Because imagine, I'm going to share my screen for a moment. Imagine you're over here, over here at the poster session. This is a big one, yeah? But imagine that um, you're, you're presenting there and as a visitor, you need to walk around. You've just sat through four or five presentations in a row. You're finally free to do a networking event, to go to coffee, to take a lunch break. And there, all these posters are waiting for you. And you have like one hour to go through all of this. And that gives, that gives, some, that gives some pressure for the visitor because they, they're meted with like a wall of text and a lot of posters they need to go through and they can only see like, let's say 10, 12 posters tops maximum. And that gives what I call the deadly combo for posters. The deadly combo for posters is a poster that is difficult to analyze, linked together with a lack of time with the participants. That gives that people skip your poster. Yeah. So that's a combo you have to work around to make sure that people stop at your poster. Now, the other thing that is playing is, of course, your poster needs to stand out. Your poster needs to stand out from the other posters around. And for example, we see, we look at this researcher here. His poster probably doesn't stand out. And you might be thinking like, yeah, okay, but this researcher approached this poster all wrong. But if we type in research poster on Google, they all look a little bit similar. So you will need to develop a poster, design a poster that stands out from the other posters. And your poster also needs to stand out from something else. I already hinted at it, but your poster needs to be better than the coffee break. Yeah, that's true. During a poster session or during a conference, the poster session is typically held in parallel with the coffee break. So it's a very hard sell because people want to go to the coffee break, want to go to do networking, and there you are with your poster saying like, hey, no, don't do all that fun stuff. Please come to me. Yeah. And that's a hard sell. And that's what I'm hoping I will help you with today with this workshop. Um, of course, we've also written a book about this workshop. We can't tackle everything today, um, which will have a step-by-step -step approach on how to make scientific posters. Now, before we jump in, first a little bit about myself. I am Tom. I'm a biochemical engineer myself. I did research on water purification, made a lot of posters along the way, but later on I started studying journalism and I went into science communication. And together with my colleagues, I uh, run The Floor Is Yours, where we help researchers to take their complex research and have it clearly explained. We do that everywhere. Um, we do that in Belgium, of course. That's where I am right now. I don't know where you are in the online world for the moment, um, but from Belgium, but also from Finland to uh, let's say Spain and all around the world from Mexico to South Africa. But today we're here and I'm here with you guys. So thanks for being here. Before I'm going to go over my principles that I've promised, like the, the basic principles for building a poster, 
I want to ask you a question. Please try to think, what is the purpose of a poster? Why do you make a poster? Because, yeah, you put in a lot of time and effort in making one, so, so why? What do you want to get out of it? Typically, if I ask this question to people, they will say something along the lines of, um, it's because I have my research and I want to communicate the results and I want to bring across the information in a clear way on a poster. And that's true to some extent. Bring across information. But it's important to know that posters are very bad at bringing across information. That's because a poster session is a very busy environment. As I said, people are under time pressure. They can't read a lot. They can give your poster like five minutes of their time, tops. So it's, it's a difficult situation. It's, it's not that good at bringing across information. Papers and, and presentations are much better at bringing across information. Posters are not that good at it. But there's another thing that posters are shine at. There's one thing that posters are tremendously good at. And that's one of the things your poster needs to do. I always say your poster needs to do two things. And the first thing it needs to do is it needs to start conversations. Yeah, so the main thing is not bringing across information. The main thing a poster needs to do is starting conversations with other people. And that is where posters are tremendously good at because during a, during a presentation or, or in a paper, there's no conversation going on. There can be a small Q&A maybe, but it's mostly one directional, in one direction. A poster, on the other hand, is two ways. You have a conversation about interesting stuff. So your poster needs to start conversations. That's the main thing it needs to do. The other thing your poster needs to do is it needs to convey your key message. You can't talk about everything on your poster because, as I said, it better bring across information, but it can convey your key message. And the convey your key message brings us to the first principle. Convey your key message is very important. Um, the question is, uh, so the first question you need to answer when you start building a poster is, what is your key message? What do you want people to remember? Because even a smaller poster session like this, well, it's not that small, but smaller than the picture I showed before. So even a smaller venue like this, people walk around, like they walk around in a supermarket. They don't really know where they're going to stop until something grabs their attention and they start to read. Now, during a poster session, they, read, they can read, let's say 10, 12, 15 posters. They won't remember everything that's on that poster. They can remember, however, one thing, and that's better be the one thing you want them to remember, and that's your key message. So take a minute and think, what could be the key message on my poster? What do I want people to remember from my research? It could be something like, we need to do this. I want you to remember this. Yeah, so a specific key message. And once you have a key message, it's your job to put it on your poster everywhere, everywhere you can. Yeah, so for example, you have a key message, I want you to put it in the title. And if that's not possible, I want you to put it in the subtitle. For example, this is the title of a poster. It read The Idiopathic Epilepsy Mystery, which is a more uh, attractive title. And then in the subtitle, it says Plasma and fecal metabolome are different in dogs with idiopathic epilepsy. That's the key message. But the metabolome is different. That's the key message. That's what this researcher wants me to remember. And I think that's a good idea. Because even if people spend 10 seconds at your poster, they will typically read the title and the subtitle. And then they know your, your main conclusion or the main thing you want to give away. Yeah. So I think that's a very good idea. Put it in your title. All right. Another place where you could put your key message is in your opening. 
And with the opening, I mean like the top part of your poster, like the thing beneath your title. Um, for example, you have this scientific poster. It's not the best scientific poster. There's a lot to be improved. Um, but it's about comparing the sensitization capacity of raw and processed cow's milk. So the poster or the researcher compared how people react allergically to raw or processed cow's milk. And top left on this poster, I'm going to enlarge it a little bit, you see a block that says conclusions. And the first sentence over there is, raw milk is hardly able to induce sensitization, this in contrast to processed milk. That's the key message. Yeah, You read one sentence on the poster, raw milk is hardly able to induce sensitization, and you know what this research is talking about. I'm not saying that on your post you should put your conclusions top left. You can keep them where they usually are. That's bottom right somewhere. But I also want the key message in the opening. Um, could be in the introduction block that you draw on a poster. Could be a separate box with a separate background color, for example. That could be also be a possibility. But try to put your key message in your opening. Works tremendously well. Okay. So you put your key message, you think about what do you want people to remember, put it in the title, put it in the opening. Another place where you could work with your key message is in the results. Um, sometimes people are struggling with like, okay, which experiment shall I talk about and which shall I exclude? Um, and my response is always, is it a result that is linked to your key message? If so, then it's okay. If not, then cut it out. Yeah. Sometimes, and I'm sure in this group there will also be people like that. You have like one overarching project and five sub-projects, work packages. And you need to make a poster and you're struggling because you have like a key message for work package one, but you want to talk about all the work packages. Yeah. That that will give you a hard time. My suggestion would be keep it to work package one, the poster or go for like an overarching narrative. But don't try to cram in five different work packages with five different key messages into one poster. That will give you a hard time. Uh, and with results, same thing. Uh, results that are linked to your key message, keep those, the rest, cut it out. Another way where results can support your key message is in the title of the graph or the table or so, put the conclusion of that graph or table and make it link to your key message. Yeah, make it support your key message. Okay. Another thing you could do with your key message is look for an image that supports your key message or play with your image to attract the attention to your key message. For example, this poster, it's in Dutch. Some of you won't speak Dutch, but that's not a problem because even if you don't speak Dutch, you immediately know where the key message is. It's in the watch. Yeah. It's a poster about wearables in the battle against Alzheimer. So this research has chosen like for a wearable front center image and then put the key message inside that image. It works tremendously well because you can't read past the conclusion that says stress monitoring with wearables can help an early detection and better surveillance of Alzheimer's. It draws the eye to the key message. And then there's one last thing you could do with your key message and that is to make it big. I put it in the biggest font I could. Make it big. Yeah. Uh, you see a tendency these days to make key messages big on posters. And I like that. For example, this poster on top, it says, dancers with hypermobility disorders are frequently misdiagnosed, which leads to more pain and a decline in dance performance. That's the key message. That's not the title. The title is smaller in bold underneath that. But I can walk past this poster, look at it for five seconds, and I know what the main thing is this researcher wants to tell me. And you see that more and more over here, using a new drone technology to track bees during flight. And, I, and when I read that, I think like, cool, you use a new drone technology to track bees. How does that work? Do you fly with little drones behind those bees? Aren't those bees scared? Why do you do that? I have so many questions. 
if on the other hand, this person would have led with the title of the poster, which is below that, and that's using piezoelectric tags and autonomous drone technology to understand the space use of bees at a landscape scale. Yeah, then I would go like, okay, good for you. Yeah, um, but that's the power of making a clear key message and showing that big on your poster. Of course, you will lose space for the rest of the content, but I think it's worth it. If you think like, ooh, I don't dare to do it that big, not a problem. And please put it in your title, in your opening, in your results, in your image somewhere. Um, that will already help a tremendous amount. And so the first principle was, the first principle of today was, your poster should convey the key message of your research, not the entire contents of your paper. And that's the first thing you need to remember when making a poster. Now, once you start building your post, you might be wondering, okay, how do I tackle text? How do I tackle text on a poster? How much text can a poster have? And that will lead me to the second principle, or the second big idea. People can read about 100 words a minute. Now, 100 words a minute is when people sit down in a quiet environment and read a text that is quite easy to read. So not a text that's in a language that they don't really grasp or not when they're reading a text full of jargon. And so it's like this setting. They, people can make up, can get to 100 words a minute. Now, as I said before, a post session is not this. A post session is a high pressure environment. Uh, look at this. Uh, take for example, you're the you're the guy at the at the at the, at the bottom over there. Um, this person is on a lot, a lot of pressure because he's trying to read the poster. At the same time, someone is talking to him. At the same time, on his left, someone else is talking about something else to someone else. There are people passing by behind them. At the same time, he's thinking like, ah, I actually had to want to go to the coffee and my time is almost up. So it's it's a high pressure environment. People won't make it to 100 words a minute. But let's say they do. I'm willing to allow it. Let's say they do. That means that they get to 400 words in four minutes. And that's the maximum you get for a poster. Maximum 400 words. And if you wonder like, how does that divide? Well, that will divide, typically it will divide along these lines, 140 to 200 words for title, introduction and conclusion. And between 260 and 300 words for the body text more or less. Um, of course, this is not written in stone. It's not that there will be a jury counting all your words, but that's a good amount to aim for. And for example, this poster has 521 words. It should go down a bit. This poster, I didn't count it. It's just too much. That's too much words. But this is a, this is a poster you, you encounter a lot. A poster like this. It's not, it's not a special poster, but this is way too many words. This poster, 300 words. That's okay. You can even raise it a little bit if you want to. But this is something people can read standing up in a couple of minutes. And that's what you should aim for. And once you start putting your text in your design software, whatever software you use, then please make your title at least 96 point big and your body text between 32 and 40 point big. Inga in says in the, in the chat, even the poster with the 521 words, I will skip. Yeah, it's true. It's, 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 it's quite heavy on words. It, will, uh, it asks a lot because there's also not that much that draws the attention. Uh, there's not too much breathing space in the text. So I get that, Inge, um, that you would skip that poster as well. But yeah, in amount of text, uh, in the sizes, font size of text, take these font sizes. Um, these font sizes are based on research 
not for scientific posters because there's not that much research for scientific posters, but this is based on research for uh, classrooms and signature on the street, like how far away can you read stuff. For example, title 96 point needs to be that big because then can, people can easily read it from three meters distance. And that's what they will do because people will take a safe distance in the beginning when scanning the title because they don't want to talk to you yet. Yeah. And once they think it's interesting, they take a step closer and they start reading the body text. And the body text 32 to 40 point, you can read that like from one meter and a half, which is a good distance, uh, safe distance from the poster and people can talk to you. Um, so try to keep those up. Um, these font sizes will only make sense if you make a poster that is A0 or A1, which is the most common poster sizes. Sometimes I see people trying to make a poster in A3, that's not small for a scientific poster, then these poster sizes, then these font sizes don't make any sense. But for the typical A0, A1, this makes sense. So yeah, that's the second principle. The second principle is very easy and that is useless words. Because formed words is all you get. Now you might be thinking, for the third one, you might be thinking, yeah, formed words is good, but I want to put more. Uh, resist the urge to do that. But you might be saying, yeah, yeah, but I have to put more. I, I have more. The golden thing you can do when you have too much is to provide a handout. Push everything that's more than 400 words, push it to a handout. On the handout, you can provide your name and your contact details. You can provide a little abstract, a link to a full paper, references. References are very good to push in a handout or extra information. Treat the handout as something that the expert wants to see when the poster is not enough. And for example, references are very good for that because references is something that the expert wants to see if he or she wants to know more. You can put your handout online. Then I would suggest uh, making a Google Doc or a PDF that you push onto a Dropbox or something like that. Take that link, typically it's a link like this long, and put it in a QR code and put that QR code on your poster so people can scan it as a handout. Now it's even better, the perfect poster handout to me is on one side of the paper, it's one, it's one sheet of paper, that's the perfect poster handout. On one side of the paper, you print your poster. On the other side of the paper, you print what I've said on this slide, your name, contact details, abstract, link to a full paper reference, everything you want to put there, an extra graph you want there, extra numbers, put it on the other side of the paper. If you have a physical one, you can hand that out to interested people and they will take it and put it in their bag, which is a good thing. Because if people just scan a QR code, you, you probably do the same. You scan a QR code, you look through it and you think, ah, cool, and you close it and you never open it again. If you have a physical printout, you have it in your bag, you take it out when you're at your desk at home uh, or at, at work. Maybe you'll even put it on the board at, at your desk somewhere. So a physical one, works quite well. Also, if you suddenly have an expert who has more questions that are not on the poster, they're typically on the handout, then you can take the handout with you and talk him through or her through the, the handout. So that works very well. For people who are wondering um, how they can make a QR code, I always use qrcodemonkey.com. Um, don't forget the dash in between. It's quite easy. You just drop in the URL. I like QR code monkey because you can um, change the color of the QR code quite easily, which makes it, it will match fairly well with your poster design. You can even put a little logo in the center. And very important if you're looking for a QR code generator for scientific posters, these QR codes don't expire. That's important because some QR codes on the internet they will only keep that QR code valid for, for a couple of weeks, for example. But then you print out your poster, take it to the conference, put it up there, and the QR code doesn't work anymore. And that's stupid. So QR code monkey doesn't have that problem. That's a place you can check. Uh, this, for example, is a poster uh, with a QR code. They have put it front center. Um, this wasn't leading to the handout. This was leading to a survey they want people to take. 
Um, and the survey was a key message, like, please take our survey. So I think it's a good spot, like front center in an image, people will always see the QR code. So yeah, that already brings us to the end of principle three. Use a handout to get information from your poster, um, which is very, very useful. By the way, if there are any questions along the way, feel free to drop them in the chat. I will see them and I will try to answer them uh, if I can. Okay, so <clears throat> first one, before you try to uh, think of a po uh, before you try making a poster, think about your key message. Second, if you start writing text, maximum 400 words uh, on your poster. Third thing, use a handout if you have more. Handouts are very useful. All right. Fourth thing I want to talk about, and this is a biggie. When you think about scientific posters, you probably think about what I call an expert poster. But there are different types, or there are different ways to tackle a poster. And I'm going to talk about two formats. The first format you probably think of is an expert poster because that's what you all know. But there's also what they call what I call a pitch poster. A pitch poster has less information, but is useful in a whole range of situations. I'm first going to introduce you to the pitch poster. Then you will be skeptical at first, maybe, but then I will tell you where you can use that. And then I will show you some examples. So, hi, meet the pitch poster. This is a pitch poster. What are different elements to put on a pitch poster? You have a short title with a scientific subtitle. In this case, the reuse of orange peels to protect crops, and as a subtitle, extracting valuable compounds out of food waste. Second element on a pitch poster, key message. But key message with a little bit extra. And over here it reads, orange peels look like waste, but they do have value. A peel contains interesting compounds like fibers or oils, with this research, we want to develop the technology to extract these materials and reuse the waste. Third element on a pitch poster, problem solution relevance block. First, you describe the problem, then you say what you're going to do about it, and then you say why it is relevant to us or, for, or to the audience that will read the poster. So the problem in this case is the food industry generates a lot of waste like residues of winemaking or peels from the juice industry. But these wastes contain valuable compounds that we don't use right now. Therefore, solution, we aim to develop biote biotechnical processes like enzymatic synthesis and fermentation based on food waste that can be used, to, for example, to protect crops. And the relevance is we can use food residues as raw materials to obtain high valuable chemicals in a more environmental friendly way. Then there are two more, uh, uh, two more things in a pitch poster. The first thing is a big image that draws the attention and is linked to the subject. And then very important QR code with contact details. Via the QR code, you push everything that you can't push into this pitch poster. Okay. That being said, where do you use a pitch poster? The truth is, you can use a pitch poster in more occasions than you can use a general expert poster like you used to. For example, um, you're present uh, oh, now, for example, you're presenting online. You're presenting your poster online. If you just show a very big poster with a lot of text, like let's say I showed you on before this one, and I start presenting to you and talking about my research, nobody can read this poster. The text is way too small, and even if they can read it, people will have to decide, like, am I going to listen to this person or again, am I going to read? So for online poster presentations, a pitch poster always works, always wins over the expert poster. Another occasion where a pitch poster is a very good idea is when uh, you do what they call a shotgun presentation. So at 
conferences, you typically more and more you see like um, that you have to come up onto stage. You get three minutes to present your poster and your poster is projected behind you. And after three minutes, you get off again. Same thing as with the online presentation. Readability is not that good with a, with a Beamer. So pitch posters are something people will be able to read during such a shotgun presentation. An expert poster, they won't be able to do that. And even again, if they can read it, they will have to decide, am I going to read or am I going to listen? You don't have to do that with a pitch poster. Pitch posters are also very useful when you're uh, at an event where there are people from a whole range of disciplines. Yeah. Uh, for example, you're at the research day of your institution. There will be people from different fields. Um, they're not interested in going deep into your topic. They just want to know what you do. And if you come across an expert that wants to know more, then you lead that person to your QR code or your handout. So it's very useful, this pitch post. If you ever go to a conference, not a research day, but a conference that's very broad, yeah, for example, climate change conference, on a climate change conference, you have uh, economists, sociologists, biologists, physicists. Uh, every, everybody does something with climate change. So you need a poster that's easy to understand for everyone. This is very useful. Yeah. Okay. Uh, industry days, patient days, stuff like that, also very useful. That being said, I have a question. I'm going to go in on that question in a second after I talked about the pitch poster. Um, okay. Uh, that being said, I'm going to show you some examples of pitch posters. For example, this is one. This was presented at the climate change conference. This is from a researcher at the Royal Meteorological Institute. And you see he has a title with a more scientific subtitle. He has that key message in the blue block on top of there. As an image, he has chosen for a map and the problem solution relevance and the QR code. He used this poster at the climate change conference and he mailed me and he said the post conference to lasted or the conference lasted five days. There were 2,500 posters, different posters a day. So that's 12,500 posters over the range of the conference. Crazy amount of posters. You had 25,000 participants. So how in the world can you stand out? Afterwards, he, um, he mailed me and he said, I stood in my post for three hours. And apart from the first and last five minutes, I was not bored, which is a good thing. I didn't have such good experience with previous posters. That's because that pitch poster, as I said, it starts conversations with everyone. Another example, this is a shotgun presentation. This was in South Africa. We trained part of the people there, not everyone. Uh, and at the conference, you had this shotgun type of presentations. Everybody got, got up onto stage, everybody presented their research. Afterwards, and this is what makes this story interesting to us, afterwards, the jury awarded prizes for the best poster presentation. The top three of people who won that prize all made pitch posters because it's it's tremendous good format for that. This lady afterwards went with this poster to another conference. She won again, yeah, because it works. This is another example of a pitch poster, discovering new therapies against fever. He uh, approached it a little bit different. He moved those blocks up, which is good for me. Uh, and didn't use the words problem solution relevance, but wrote what the problem was. I think that's a good idea. It says in the first block, it says not problem, but it says current therapies have limited efficacy. I think, like, okay. And just by reading the titles of those three blocks, I know what this person is working on. Current therapies have limited efficacy, unraveling the disease pathway. So it tries to unravel that, that pathway. And relevance now, the impacts, the attacks impact the patient's quality of life now. So we need to change that. So, and as an image, he chose for that pathway that he works on. Works tremendously well. One more example of a pitch post is this one. The beneficial effects of nature, the impact of green spaces in uh, schools. And I like this poster a lot. Now, I'm sure 
a lot of you would be thinking like, ah, no, this, no, I'm not going to use this at a conference. And I think, but first off, I think you can, but this research may this poster to be put up in schools. And then this makes a tremendous amount of sense. Imagine that this researcher would have come up with this poster and put that up in schools. It, it wouldn't work at all. Yeah. So it's audience based. And then the final one I want to show you is this pitch poster about biomarkers for obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, problem solution relevance again. Now, this researcher made this poster and she was going to a, a, a quite a narrow focused conference. And she said, yeah, I know I made this pitch poster, but now I'm afraid of using it. Because what would my supervisors say? What would the people at the conference say? Will they say this is not professional enough? And I said, I understand. I understand the, that you hesitate because it's something different than you're used to, but please try it out. And afterwards she, 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 she let me know how it went. And she said, the poster was successful. There were people ready to address me even before I had fully put it up. I spoke to several researchers and also made arrangements to jointly discuss our findings in the future when I have some more results. In addition, I received a promising proposal for a possible collaboration. In short, I'm very satisfied with both the event and the impact of the poster. I will definitely use the pitch format in the future. So it works because a pitch poster is primarily suited not at bringing across information, but at starting conversations. Yeah. So remember, um, that was one of the things I said a poster needs to do. It needs to start conversations and a pitch poster is very good at it. Um, so yeah. A good question in the Q&A about this. Uh, it's in Dutch, so I will try to translate it on the go. Um, she, she tells me the pitch poster looks very interesting, but if you, uh, yeah, if you yeah, if you want to give a poster presentation on a conference, often you have to choose for the classical formats, title, introduction, results, and discussion. Yeah. How can you combine these two aspects? Okay, Emily, um, I will get that question first. The thing is, or the thing you're struggling with probably is that they have some kind of template you have to keep to. Yeah, or they say like, what, what, or you send something in and, they, and then they have to decide. So like, are you... So if you send something in, yeah, for sure you can type down the results and the, because they will be interested in what's this about. If it's a template issue, um, then I want to show, oh no, that's not the button I want to push. About templates, I want to, I have a slide over here that I'm going to grab quite quickly. Here, um, a template typically looks something like this. Yeah, and they say like, okay, we need your methods, we need your introduction, your results and your discussion and so on. Now, the thing is, and that's also true for people who organize conferences, the reason why they give you a template is because they want everybody to have like the same dimensions so that the posters are all landscape or uh, all landscape or all portrait and all A0 or all A1. So it's all similar. But the thing with templates is the thing you need to use from a template is this. The header and the footer so that people see what organization it's from or what event it is but in between you're free to do whatever you want it's not that you have to put your introduction in this case top right and that you have to take your graph and put it there and have to take an image and put it there no they want a similar sized poster that looks the same so the other thing i would use if if i'm working for a, a, an institution or for a conference is what i would use is also the color scheme in this case purple and blue um, and i also would use the fonts that's also something I would use. Um, but apart from that, you're free to do whatever you want. And that's a freedom you can uh, take for sure. Yeah. Okay, that was a short answer. Uh, David says, are there templates for different types of posters? Uh, David, yeah. What I typically tend to do is, um, what I typically tend to do with templates of posters is I go to uh, Pinterest, not Google Images, because on Google Images, you can't find like the nice poster, but on Pinterest, and I type in scientific poster, maybe with your domain, uh, I don't know, biology, economy, and look what pops up. And then you get like overviews of how they can look. 
Um, and that tremendously, that helps with getting in a design, but there's not typically, an organization typically provides you with one type of template, if they provide a template at all. That being said, there's a, also design software, for example. Uh, a lot of people make their poster in PowerPoint, but I also get more and more people who work uh, for their poster in Canva, C-A-N-V-A, canva.com. And Canva provides templates, color schemes, ready-made elements, stuff like that. Um, not only for posters, also for pliers and videos and stuff like that, but you can use it for posters as well. And I see some very nice results coming out of that. All right. Then there was someone who asked like, how do you structure posts that presents preliminary ideas and concepts and don't have results yet? My answer is again, a pitch poster is a very good idea because you sketch the problem, the solution and the relevance. Like why is this useful that I am doing this, but you don't have that much results yet. Yeah, that's not a problem because they don't belong on the pitch poster. That being said, you can put results on a pitch post if they're important, make the image and put it in a map or something like that. But um, I think that's a good one. All right. Um, Maybe Alfine one says, can you oh. use a pitch poster as well for systematic reviews? Yeah, you can, but then you have to go back to the question, what's my key message with a systematic review? Like, what do I want to bring across? Um, the problem, with a systematic review is typically like, hey, we've got a bunch of information uh, and we lose sight of what the result is or what, what the, the, the common ground is, everyone. And I'm going to look into solution. I'm going to look into and combine this by doing this and this and this. So that relevance in the end, we have a better understanding of this domain or something like that. All right. Aina Lem asks, will there be a recording of this session? Yes, there will be an analyse. We'll send it to you afterwards, together with the discount code for the for the book as well, the, the standout with your poster book, if you're interested. Okay, fifth thing that can really help making a scientific poster is make a sketch in advance, before you start building your poster. And with making a sketch, I really mean make a sketch. Like, draw it out. I like it on paper. You can do it on a computer as well, of course, but on a paper, easy to do. And for example, in this sketch, you see then, uh, um, this researcher has the title over there, in vessel retention of a nuclear explosion. So how do you keep a nuclear explosion inside a vessel with a more scientific subtitle beneath it? And then he thought like, ah, let me put the introduction block over here with the key message. Um, I'm not going to put it top left, like everybody else, I put it, put it in the middle, maybe with a colored background. <clears throat> Bottom right, I'm going to put a small design element the, that conveys the released energy when, when you have an explosion. And then on the left, I'm going to put like a, a pathway or a, or, a, or a process, and I'm going to work with that. And by doing that in advance, you will save a tremendous amount of time. By doing that thinking on a piece of paper quickly, you will save a tremendous amount of time. Uh, this is another example of a, an easy sketch, title on top. Then you had like this kind of, and it's about paving the way towards animal-free dairy. So she's trying to make cheese without animals. Um, that was the title. And then, and then you have some kind, now you have some kind of road thing going on with the cheese in the middle that she wants to do there. And then she wants to split the proposal in three blocks. And then she wants to end with the conclusion. What I like about this poster is from this poster, I had the sketch from the beginning and I also had the final result. And the final result looks like this. Yeah? And you see the sketch coming back by, bit by bit. So you have the title, you have that road thing going on, the poster that splits into three, and then the conclusions at the bottom. And I'm sure this researcher wouldn't have come up with this ID of that road, for example, if she wouldn't have sketched it in advance. It will save you a lot of time because if you just start dumping text into, let's say, PowerPoint, when you make posts in PowerPoint and then start moving stuff around and cutting stuff, that will give you a hard time making a poster. Sketching it in advance really works very well. Um, and if you make a sketch, try to think of different, uh, we just had a question about templates, but try to think of different ways of building a poster. This is the, the very standard block, 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 block poster, which is okay. 
But if you want your post to stand out, it's better to not use block, 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 but do something else. Um, this, for example, is a road. Yeah. Mind you, it's a very well-designed road. You don't have to do it like this. But this, if you boil it down to what it is, it's just a line with some boxes popping out of it. So if you have like a process or a step-by-step -step thing or a timeline, or th then this makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I had someone saying like, what do I do if I don't have results yet? Well, then you do problem solution relevance. This is why we're going to do it. And then you draw a line and you say, these are my next steps. And I want to finish here. This is my final result in two or three years. Yeah, something like that. Could be a possibility. This is another approach you see quite often. Circle in the middle with something and the rest around it. Um, it's a good approach. Now, in this case, I wouldn't put text in the center. I would put an image or even better, your key message in the center and the rest around it. Um, but it's a possibility. Um, this is not a poster. Full picture on the background and then text around it. Works, works very well as well. Um, so as I said, Pinterest is quite a good medium to look for good poster examples. Just look over there. You can save them also for later on quite easily. It's better than Google Images because if you type in Google Images research poster, they all look the same. Um, and you don't get the nice results. All right. So yeah, that's principle five of this lunch talk. Making a sketch will lead to a better poster and will win, will win you tremendous amounts of time. So it's a good idea to do that. And that leads us to the sixth principle I want to talk about today. Because once you've made a poster, you've printed it out, you go to the conference and there you are at the conference. And then this happens. You're standing there next to your poster. People are reading it and it's uncomfortable because you don't know. Should I talk to them? Do they talk to me? Do, uh, do I let them read? Do I interrupt? How does this work, this social thing? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm here to tell you that as a researcher during a post-it session, it's your job to open the conversation. Don't wait for the other people to open the conversation because then you will only talk to people who are very extrovert and very sure of themselves, who want to talk to you. You will lose a lot of people. So it's your job to open the conversation. So if you're there and someone stops at your post, you don't have to grab everyone passing your poster, you just, you, but if someone stops at your post and reads the post for let's say 10 or 20 seconds, that's your clue to open the conversation. And the easiest way to open a conversation at a conference is asking a simple question. And that is something you should stick in your mind, like when you're going to a conference, what is your question? Because the question links that those people to you and to your poster. Huh? Let's say there's a researcher there, you do research on composable plastics. You could ask like, have you ever had um, a pen made out of composable plastics? And then they would say, uh, yes, or uh, no, or uh, does it exist? And you say like, yes, it does exist, but you don't have a lot of pens made like that right now because it's too, uh, too costly, for example. And hope you take that person to your poster where you talk about the more efficient process of making bioplastic pens and blah, blah, blah. So you need to make a short link. You go like, can I ask you a question? Yes. They will typically say yes. If they say no, they, they go like, okay, okay, uh, have a nice day. Um, but if they go yes, they go, okay, this pen made out of bioplastics. Have you ever seen a pen made out of bioplastics? And they go, uh, yes or no. Uh, it really links you to your poster. Um, and the big advantage of asking a question is also you could... Um, you get a good idea of the expertise level of the person in front of you. Because if you ask, for example, um, do you know we can compost bioplastic pens? And the person in front of you answers with, yes, I know it's that microorganism at that temperature with that pressure, you know, like, ooh, okay, expert. 
and I can get my expert talk. If the person answers, ah, I didn't know that existed compostable plastics, then you know, okay, other level to start my conversation. So that's an added advantage of the question. So yeah, uh, sixth principle was, it's your job to get the conversation started. Yeah. All right. Um, we're nearing the end of the lunch talk. I'm happy that you were here. I could only scratch the surface, of course. I hope this was valuable, but I could only scratch the surface. Um, as I said, we've written a book that gives a step-by-step -step approach. Step one, step two, step three, step four, when making a scientific poster. We didn't talk about how you may write a good introduction, how you can use a permit structure to get the content on your poster right, how to do titles, images, the design of your poster, how to do data stuff, how to add an element of surprise, and much more. Um, you can find that in that book. Um, there will be a discount code in your mail in, uh, in the near future. Uh, that gives 10% off and free shipping, I think. Um, there's, of course, also the workshop that Annalise already hinted at that I will be giving as well, uh, the poster workshop in November. She will send that information to you as well. I see her nodding, so I will, I will guess that's true. Um, so uh, feel free to join. There we go, like, for hours on your post, and you will make your own poster as well. Um, so that's a very nice ending of that day, so you can walk home with a poster that is almost finished, won't be entirely finished. Um, if you ever have questions, you can always reach me at tone at the floor is yours .be. Um, I'm always happy to see good examples, good posters, let me know. But that being said, uh, we open the room for questions, if there are any more questions. For example, I see Diana asking, is it fine to use a dark background in a poster? Yes, that's okay, it's personal preference. Uh, the thing is, a, 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 bla a black poster takes a lot of ink and then the text is white. Now, typically, a white background with black text is more readable. Now, if you say my dark background comes from a picture or a photo, then be sure that the contrast with your text is big enough. Sometimes you go people for a brownish picture with a black text on top of it. That gets hard to read. So be mindful of readability, but you can make a poster in a dark background color. The things you have to be careful about is really flashy colors. If that's too big, if you go like full background, flashy yellow, that could be a problem for people's eyes. Yeah, You can do small boxes of yellow stuff, of course. Someone asks, but that's for Annalise to answer, I think, what's the price of the workshop in November? I'm thinking of sending my students. Uh, they're more than welcome, your students. I don't know what the price is, Annalise will say. And otherwise, if it's too expensive, this book costs 25 euros. Uh, that will also help. Um, David says, do you have sessions on how to make better PowerPoint presentations? Um, I'm first going to answer personally, and then Annalise can answer. David, yes, uh, with the floor is yours. We do sessions on how to present your research, how to pitch your research. Uh, we do that often uh, to tens of thousands of researchers already. Uh, we also have written a book about that as well. Um, so yeah, for sure, the floor is yours .be. You can find all the information there, but the Psycho Academy also uh, organizes them. And yes, we also have a presenting you can add on for that. Yes, uh, presenting on stage course. Uh, if you scan this QR code, it will take you directly to the website where you can see the one. To answer the previous question, um, the course for the poster design will be 159. Uh, 95 euros, I'm sorry. Yes, and it's a full day of workshop, um, everything included, and also a part of an online learning platform. But we can share uh, more information if you want via mail or whatever. Yeah, and the full day works is really fun day because you, you have time to work on your poster, to build a post, you get a lot of feedback on what you build. So I, I noticed it's very valuable for uh, students. Uh, Inge says, is there also a minimum uh, of words or can you just use graphs and pictures? Um, be uh, mindful of, there's not a minimum amount of words, but your poster needs to be able to speak in itself still. Um, so you won't be around your poster the entire time. You will have to run to the bathroom or want to attend a presentation. So your poster needs, people need to be able to understand your poster without you being there. And if it's like um, uh, a, a graphic novel without text, let's say, or or or, uh, or 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 a riddle that they almost have to solve to guess like what this what does each each picture mean? 
they run across uh, trouble. So I think you will need words. The pitch post, by the way, is typically about 150 to 200 words, something like that. I think that's something you can get away with. If you go lower than 100 words, I think people will get a hard time to uh, understand what's on your poster. Then someone asks, um, good graphic design programs to make posters, like the example with the road. Well, the the nicest design posters I see nowadays are made with Canva, canva.com. I will put it in the chat as well, canva.com. Um, is a low learning curve. That being said, if you use PowerPoint, perfect. Um, also low learning curve. You know how to draw boxes and stuff in PowerPoint, it's good. Um, other software, I typically use InDesign, which is the Adobe. Eh? You have Adobe Photoshop. You also have Adobe InDesign, which is made for flyers, posters, brochures, stuff like that. But it has a high learning curve. If you don't know how to use Photoshop or Illustrator, I wouldn't recommend it. And it's quite expensive. So. Only use that if you already have it. Otherwise, I would just keep it to PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint or Canva or something else with one uh, if you have like one poster to make. Canva is a really nice tool also for other things where you need a, a template, even for social media posts or whatever. Uh, Canva is a really good resource. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they also have like yeah a lot of ready-made elements and nice color schemes, and so that works. That works tremendously well typically. Uh, there's another question. I don't know if you saw. Um, maybe. In less related to this uh, course, but what do you do if somebody asks a question and we're not sure about the answer during a poster presentation? During a poster presentation. So you arrive, uh, so you stand next to your poster, someone arrives, uh, asks a question, and you don't know the answer. Uh, depends on the situation, but remember a poster session is a conversation. That's the idea of a poster session. So don't be afraid of admitting you don't know the answer yet. Then you say something like, Oh, that's a good question. I didn't thought about that. What do you think? You play the question back. Um, or if you have an idea, but you're not sure, you just say like, ah, good question. I think it's something like that, but I'll have to check. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. So uh, if you don't know the answer, always, uh, yeah, try to, you can play it back. Don't make up things and send them out as truth when you're not sure it's true, of course. Yeah. Um, so that's something you can do for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, we answered almost all questions or all the questions that were asked. And it's also one o'clock, so we don't want to keep everybody for too long. But I think it was a very interesting session also for myself. Uh, still, of course, things to learn. Um, I think everybody also had a lot of positive feedback. I will send a follow-up mail with the recording of the session uh, with the 10% discount to the book and also with a link to uh, the website of The Floor is Yours and our website to the workshop so you can all check out all of the information uh, today or tomorrow in the follow-up mail. And I want to thank you all for being here and I hope to see you, of course, in September. And thank you especially, Ton, for all of the nice insights and we will see each other soon, surely. For sure. Bye, everyone. Have a nice day. Have a nice afternoon. I will stop the share, um, mm -hmm. but enjoy. Charlotte says, thanks for the interesting session. Uh, no problem, Charlotte. Uh, yeah. Happy to do that. Hope it was useful. It's a lot um, of thank yous in the Q&A. That's really nice to hear. Yeah.